Okay, so, um, come on, internet. There so my name's Sean, uh, Sean Manzi. I'm the uh, 17U um, coach at Guelph Youth Volleyball in Guelph, Ontario, Canada, the country right above America. Um, so I, uh, I've been coaching for about 18 years, um, way longer than my players have been alive. And I have an Associates of Arts in Journalism, a Bachelor of, Sci of Science in Sport Communication with Coaching Emphasis, and a Master of Education in Human Performance and Sport. So my whole degrees have been in talking, coaching, and strategizing, if you want to make that a word. Sure. Um, and the whole point of a, a coaching philosophy is really developing what you desire out of yourself that you can apply to your athletes. Um, <clears throat> so for me, I have way, very minimal rules. Um, number one is engage. Uh, number two is challenge. Um, three is we is better than me. And then number four is don't be a jerk. Um, and so when I, when I want to engage, it's really asking open-ended questions. And when I ask an open-ended question, then it really prompts the athlete or the person to think. Um, I don't believe in joystick coaching where I say, do this, do that. Uh, I believe in the Socratic method, which is cooperative dialogue. And I really enjoy when my athletes tell me I'm wrong. And when I'm an idiot and when I'm being just a dumbass, because 90% of the time I am. Um, but it also shows that they're paying attention, um, that they have the confidence in themselves to speak up to authority, uh, if you could call that that. And then understanding that their input is very valuable. So I don't care if it's the quietest person who says, hey, coach, I think that's their opinion is still respected and listened to. Um, I don't really believe in very many rules because if we have so many, then too many people or too many rules are going to get misconstrued and um, it's just going to turn into not good. So the big thing about developing your coaching philosophy is why do you coach? Um, you and I have been doing this long enough where we know it's not the paycheck. You know, it has nothing to do with money. We, we love this sport of volleyball or connecting with players or, um, or just being involved in sport. Um, and, and what is a win to you? That's where we got to figure out the importance of our philosophy is what do you believe is a win? Um, scoreboard or character? When um, actually this past season, uh, we had a girl go up for a block, ball touched her finger. It was a relatively close point in the game. And um, the line judges are parents, so they don't really know what the heck they're doing, except for one. Um, and he, they just didn't know what was going on. So I went up to my athlete. I'm like, hey, did you touch that ball? And she said, yes. I'm like, okay, go be honest and go tell them. And she told the ref, and the R1. And after she did that, you know, we kind of played the game out. Afterwards, the line judge came up to her and I and said that he's been coaching and been around this game for, you know, nine years with his daughter playing, and he'd never seen that before. You know, that honesty. And that was cool. That was really awesome to see. Um, just that we had that recognition. And that you could tell it was a learning and growing moment for her. That the honesty and sportsmanship was a little bit more appreciated than hiding the touch. So that's why I really enjoy coaching at this level. I got the 17U team. Um, and, and what I really believe is a win is development so again why do you coach is this another thing of what person in your life helped influence you 
uh, was it a teacher? Was it another coach? Um, was it a parent who, whomever, but what in your life did you have to influence you to become a coach? Uh, here in Canada, it's a lot of, okay, well, you played in grade six or seven, you can be the coach, go for it. Well, that's, that's kind of what happens. So there's my little, my darling kids. Uh, we won a tournament this year and um, we were pretty excited about it. So why do you coach and what motivates? Uh, intrinsic is interior motivation. I, as a father and a husband, I'm going to be motivated to just grind and, and, and hustle and work for my family. Are these gold medals going to be motivation for my girls? And obviously each person is different, but the intrinsic is internal rewards. Um, and each one is internal benefits, extrinsic exoskeleton, like a crab is out ulterior outside, such as fame, awards, wins, and praise. Um, so how are you going to decipher that into your philosophy of what do you want versus what do your players want? And when you write out your coaching philosophy, that is really something that needs to be addressed early. Um, so we have all these objectives of sport. We want to win. We want to help. We want to develop. Um, we want people to be the best that they deserve. And we want people to grow in and off the court. So when you're growing, you can really see that it's going to be beneficial to society, which is more important. I was talking to, uh, I was talking to somebody right before this, and he's hopped on and he said, well, what's, uh, what am I going to be looking for? I'm like, well, do you have a coaching philosophy? And then, well, well, no, you, he didn't, you know, and so this hopefully will help him. So we want to develop a coaching philosophy because it really gives direction to what you already believe. And it's going to circumvent any uncertainty in regards to, okay, I've got this really good player, but they missed all these practices. I've got this really crappy player who comes to all the practices who gets more playing time. And at certain levels, you can really say, um, you, one of my favorite ones is, you know, uh, you pay for practice from Kessel, where he's like, you're really paying for the development during practice. And when you go to a match, then it's really a discretion of uh, the coach because it's different strategies, different player, you know, what have you. <clears throat> so this coaching philosophy really eliminates any sort of uncertainties in regards to discipline, code of conduct, play. And it really keeps your head in check in regards to what you're going to be doing with your team. And I really enjoy it because you can sit here and say, okay, I believe that we want to win and we're going to win at all costs. And I don't care if that uh, star player has missed five practices. In a row. That's going to be my philosophy. And that doesn't matter what your, your motivation is, as long as you stick to it. You know, um, I think my personal example is I, can't stand when people are wavering and do okay well this and that and in all fairness i don't care about the emotion and all your emotions i care about can you produce can you do what we desire of you so that's in my philosophy is i'm going to engage you and i'm going to talk to you but i also want you to do your damn job that's simply basic so i'm five foot six I have less hair than a bald cat, and I realize this. And my philosophy or my coaching style is more of a, a Phil Jackson type. So when you're writing your coaching philosophy, you really have to understand and do a lot of internal digging about what type of coaching style you have and how you interact with your athletes. 
Um, are you Bobby Knight, the command coach, the cooperative coach of Phil Jackson, or the cooperative coach with Vision with Tara Vanderveer? And I love, I love, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Maurizio, right? The this Brazilian coach. Um, Bernardinho, Zilberto. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Which one? <clears throat> that one that's on the screen. What's his name? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's you just see so much passion with who he is as a as a coach, because quite frankly, he does a great job. Oh, Bruno Rosendo. Thanks, Len. Okay. So the important aspect is realizing who you are as a person and then splaying it on to your paper and writing things down is so beneficial to what you believe because it's just, you're finally getting it all out and, and you have a, a tangible list and a tangible thing. Uh, so what's inside your philosophy, your major objectives, um, and your beliefs, your principles that really construe, um, and attach to your objectives and achieve. So every year after every season, maybe a couple months after when you've been able to reflect, uh, about what went well, what didn't go well. Um, and hopefully you've been journaling throughout the whole season. We really should uh, redo our coaching philosophy. Um, maybe not strap it and forget about it and do something totally different, but really amend what worked and what didn't work and be realistic about your levels and your expectations. And if you're at a 12U team and your expectation is to win at all costs and that's your philosophy, great. But what happens when you don't win? What happens when you've come short of what you believe or what you want to believe? And at 12, 15U, you know, that gamut of range, is it really the kids who have faltered or is it you who have faltered as a coach? Um, so our Kilikos, obviously they're said, we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. So I could expect to win all the time, but that doesn't mean anything until I've put in the effort and the proper training. So when I'm really emphasizing my philosophy or your philosophy, it's about how am I going to make that a big part of my training? Okay. And you can't sit here and say like Al Davis and say, just win, baby. It doesn't just happen. Um, before you continue, just a yes. uh, side note for everybody. If you have questions at any time along the way, doesn't matter if it's about something that Sean's talking about right now, what he talked about mm -hmm. before, something that he might be getting at later. Feel yeah, free please. to put them in, in the question and answer. It's better than the chat. The Q&A is better than the chat, um, yeah. just to keep them focused. But you can put them in any time. And when, when we get to a point where it makes sense, I'll, I'll insert them into the conversation. Perfect. There we go. I like it. Um, so I sourced a lot of these, um, all these uh, images off of volleyball coaches and trainers a long while ago. And I think this is one of my favorite ones. Because you can see that the great relationship that this coach and athlete have is he looks dorky, he's in a tutu, but it doesn't matter. They, they have that great relationship. And so, okay, so we've got our three selves. Ideal self, who you project and who you want to be. Your public self, your image and what people see of you, and who you actually are, your real self. So I know that I'm very outspoken and um, I don't know, if, I mean, not flamboyant, but extravagant, I guess you'd say. Um, but I have to tie in all three of those, especially with a coaching philosophy in regards to 
how am I going to get the best out of all three of these to get the best out of all 12 of my athletes? Um, so you're not going to have your real self really come out with your athletes. Uh, you know, they don't come home and, you know, do your taxes and your laundry and all this stuff with you at home. Um, so you have to figure out what image of your public self can be portrayed as best to your athletes as possible. And when you're in that projection mode of your public self, you have to understand that it's also of uh, parents and administrators, uh, officials, um, linesmen, etc. So when we've got our public self, how are we going to tie that into our real self in regards to our coaching philosophy? So this philosophy takes a lot of a lot of internalization. Uh, maybe some some journaling would be fantastic, you know. But really take into consideration who you are as a person, uh, in in home and in public. So these are really important because they really dictate which type of coach you are. So now is one of my favorite parts of the, I guess, the talk of the the interaction is are you one of these three? Like who is your ideal self and is your ideal self and your public self um, the same or is your private and personal or your personal and your ideal? Like how are you going to combine the three to become the one? Right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's one of my favorite quotes is putting things in the perspective of children. Is the children now love luxury? They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. And that was from Socrates. Now, if you think about it, how many times have we as adults, um, John, how old are you? In your late to mid 40s? A little bit later than that, early but 60s? yes. Not early 60s? 60s? No. <laughs> Not quite that later. <laughs> okay, so I'm 35. Um, and when you look at a 17 year old or 18 year old or 22 year old, right, who don't know any better, you can sit here and say, oh, well, <laughs> what Socrates just said, you know, they love luxury and they've got banner manners and they don't care about authority. And kids these days. And how many times have you have we heard kids these days? Well, More it's than like, I can count. Yeah, exactly. And it's because they don't really know better. It, there's a select few that have ventured out into the world and understand different norms and colloquialisms. But in reality, what's the one thing you're really good at talking about? You know, it, it's yourself. And so when you've got a 17 year old who doesn't know any better or who hasn't had the same experiences you have had, you can't compare who you are now to who they are now. This is where we as coaches can really give them perspective and connection in regards to, okay, so here's where you as a teenager are now. Here's how you can be better in the future. Uh, and that's that's one thing that I really want to see in, in most philosophies of uh, I lean towards development of self and of person rather than wins. You know? I'd, I'd also insert in there, we don't have a particularly good memory of who we were. Going back to your question of which self are you? Yeah. That, do you I didn't really, think about do you really yeah, remember you. yourself as a 17-year-old? Because I don't. I, I kind of want to go back and kick my own ass. Like, I, yeah, I just, yeah, no, it was, it was a while. And so it was, it's 17 year olds. I think, um, oh, geez, Lil Wayne has a, a lyric in one of his songs that he has the swagger of a college kid, you know, and is you 18, 19, 20, you think you could take on the world. And in reality, you don't know anything about life. You know, it's, it's hard. It's really difficult.
Yeah, there's there's an ad uh, for like the great courses, I think, mm-hmm. where um, what's his name? The the, uh, the cosmologist. Paul Mitchell? No. No, 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 no. That's the hair guy. <laughs> no. Um, oh, the guy, the guy who does uh, Star Talk. He's got a three part name. Oh, oh did, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yes, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He, he, he leads this thing off basically by saying one of the big challenges in life is to, it's basically has to do with knowing that you don't know. It's yeah. like you, you, you're to the point where you, where you think you know, but you don't realize that you don't know. Yeah. And how do you push beyond to the point where you know you don't know? Yeah, and that's, that's growth. And that's where maturity occurs. Maturation occurs. So here's, here's uh, the part that I was talking about before we started about um, inciting um, elation is at the end of the day, people won't remember what you said or did. They'll only remember how you made them feel from my Angelou. And again, this ties back into how are you going to be remembered? You don't really have much to give people except for your personality and your persona. And the only thing I really have to give my kid is my name. So he better do something really well in life. And I expect, expect the same thing out of all my athletes that they're going to be feeling like, huh, yeah, like I am, I am worth something. I am worthwhile. Um, I had a, a parent message me the other day saying how she actually missed our interactions at, at practice. You know, she missed giving hugs and she missed our talks. And so that was, that made me feel good. You know, it made me feel really good that she legitimately missed who I am. But how are you going to take that into your coaching philosophy? Is, are you going to be one of those three coaches, the, the cooperative, the demanding, or the cooperative with vision? Which one of those three, how do you want to be remembered? All right. Since you brought that up. Yes. I got a question as to, can you define the difference between cooperative, cooperative with vision? Yeah. Okay. So cooperative with vision and cooperative. Okay. Let me, let me start. Cooperative is just working together in that one season. Um, And you look at Phil Jackson and he's got so many, um, so much turnover that he really has to focus on. I'm going to ask more of you now, and then you'll get your, uh, I guess, life lessons later. The Tara Vanderveer works on the four-year cycle where it's, I can actually instill cooperation now, and I expect you as an incoming freshman to have just as much say as you do when you're a senior, uh, fourth year. So the vision is long-term, and then that's working together. And then the vision, or excuse me, the cooperation is all working congruently. Okay. Right. Hope that helps, Mo. Yep. So this is uh, the the one. Actually, the one thing I would throw out to Maya Angelo. Yes. Is that in a certain regard, she clearly has never coached, because as anybody who's coached any length of time knows, the kids do remember stupid stuff, like stuff you don't even remember saying or yeah. doing someday. Now it's usually not necessarily anything big, but yeah. it's just like remember that time when coach said this or blah blah blah. You know, the, oh. the, you know, the kid who you, you said something in their first year of college and yeah. they whipped it out to the senior just to give you a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> it, it happens all the time. And I, I'm, I wouldn't doubt it if I have uh, a couple sound bites or two, but whatever. I mean, yeah. Whatever. Um, but no, yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite things. And like, um, one, of my, one of my favorite coaches that I had was uh was angela rock and (laughs) she she was great like she just said some of the most off the wall stuff and like rock did you really just say that she's like yeah yeah why not oh okay all right angela all right she's owning it 
She and that's what I love about her. That's that's what I love about her. And and one of the best coaches that I was, one of my other favorite coaches that I've had was uh, was Dave Shoji. Which I don't know what Shoji. I don't know what Shoji did I have. Well, uh, Dave is the father. Uh, no. Uh, Tom Shoji. Excuse me. I feel like an idiot now. Can't even remember his first name. We just call him Shoji. But it, you just always remember how he interacted with you. And I had him for one season in San Diego, and he was just the coolest guy. And he obviously knew a thing or two about volleyball. You know, and and that's what I enjoyed about him is he didn't he didn't he didn't tell you about his volleyball history and, and anything. He just taught and he was a great teacher and he was a great interactor. And, um, and that's one thing that I, I, as a personal coach, want to see you guys experience in your coaching philosophy is how are you going to leave your lasting mark? And he did. Okay, so this is more of the interactive section. Um, but, like, what was, uh, to the, the audience that I really can't see, like, what was a good or positive or bad um, mentor or significant person in your life? And, you know, I, I actually want to hear from people of what was good, what was bad, why did they incite this emotion? Um, All right, so, the chat. yeah, chat, Go, do your chat thing, you know, chat it up. So there's, there's one thing that I enjoy about that it, like you can put into your philosophy of good and bad and model mentor is that so many picking and choosings of sitting and watching and listening and talking and, and interacting with other coaches. Um, so I think in 2000, uh, when was the last Olympics? What year is it? 16. 2016, when Karch was head coach, right? Um, they had the cameras on him at one point, I believe, and he's like, okay, what are you going to do better? What are you going to do better? What are you going to do better at coming out of this timeout? And you could see the athletes were like, okay, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do that. And that was one thing that was really, really awesome to watch is he didn't have to lead a timeout. He just put it back on them. So that's one thing I did this season and I think it worked. I also was, it also was a point when it was a timeout and I didn't know what to say. So that's just what I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all had those a time or two. Like, uh, and so what, I mean, and then we've also had times where you've got coaches who are yelling at players and you see them shrink. So have you ever been in a moment where you get so frustrated or so angry or so even positive, even elated, but then you have to realize that's not what is in your coaching philosophy. So that's another thing to think about when you're writing down your philosophy is how are you going to quell your emotions and learn that just because they did something well or bad, is that part of how you coach or what you want to coach? You know, you could say like, okay, a player hit a ball four to four, but you can't get angry at them that they blasted the girl down the line and packed the libero. You know, it's so again, is that your joystick coaching or is that your um, kind of free for all method methodology? Do we have anything going on? Okay, I'm depression button here. It's... No, no, they're they're awfully quiet in the peanut gallery right at the moment. Well, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Mo oh. just Mo just tossed one in. Oh, Mo. I recognize and talk to my players that my weakness is body language okay. during times of struggle. Mm, I know it extends to the players. This is something that I've worked hard on for years. Yeah, mm. body language is a huge thing. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, it really is. And <laughs> when I was coaching guys in, in North Carolina, you know, they're college guys. And 
during the match, you're focused and, and, and whatever. And I subbed off my right side and he thought that I was angry at him. I'm like, Oh my God. Like, come on, man. It's, it was funny because the situation was strategically, he was a terrible server and defender. We were at a point and yada, yada, yada. So it was a strategic move. He's like, oh, the coach is all angry at me because I got subbed off. I'm like, oh my God. Like, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that idea that there's a, a, there's a personal thing in relation to coaching decisions, the, the, at least that the players perceive. Yeah. It's actually something that kind of came up in our discussion the other day yeah. about culture development. Okay. And learning how to work through that sort of stuff because there's, there's players that are that way they think if you don't play them or they don't get as much playing time or they get subbed or whatever that it's oh coach hates me yeah coaches coaches mad at me or or whatever sure when it doesn't it's not it's not like that it's not a personal no. thing it's just this is no. the situation yeah um, and my favorite conversation is at the beginning of the year when i lay out to my players i don't care about your emotions I just don't because in the time and the moment it is purely strategic. And if you want to have emotions, we'll deal with it later. You know, we'll talk and we'll discern and then we'll communicate and hopefully there's growth and understanding. But in the moment you could be as poopy pants as you want. And that makes me way not want to deal with you anyways. So I don't know. Okay, so here's what I took from a guy named John Kessel. Um, John and I were sitting at Bowdoin and watching his daughter play uh, against my team, Bates. And John and I sat there and he said, because I came from all these different things, is that girls can do an action four out of five correct and dwell on the one incorrect. And boys are inverse, and they talk about how great that one thing was that they did. So what I see is that if you have a lot more positive reinforcement with females, then there's going to be definitely a, a more of an upswing. Whereas with boys, and you subtract and detract emotion from coaching and focus on the facts that, hey, you sucked, right, in that rotation. Uh, in rows, you know, three and four, you shouldn't be doing that, whatever. So <clears throat> what I enjoy about coaching females is that it's a lot more positive and a lot more upbeat. Whereas here we go with boys is that you have to barely realize that who you are as a person, and they're going to test you. And they're going to question and they're going to, uh, you know, you give them an inch and they'll take a mile. So that's one thing I really see is the difference in the genders. And when you really discern your philosophy, how are you going to put that into um, your coaching style? Um, and with boys, it's really easy to be, um, you know, the authoritative Bobby Knight kind of leader and yell at him. And I mean, heck, we can yell at each other and punch each other and then go out for beers later. Like that's what I enjoy about being a guy. But with girls, it's, it's really have to understand that difference and understand that you kind of have to walk on eggshells. And, and is that going to be a big chunk of how you're going to maneuver your season? This subject will be going into considerably more depth on Wednesday. Oh, good. Because good. we've got two coaches, one male, one female, who have both coached male and female teams. At awesome. The, at the upper levels. So. Well, now I'm going to watch two of your episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't strain yourself. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got a thing that day. Oh, it's going to be early, too. I think it's an 8 a.m. What, Eastern time? Yeah. Well, it's two European-based coaches. Oh, cool. Oh, I'm excited to see that then. Um, actually, there was a, a funny story. is a long while ago when I first moved up here to Canada. 
this guy had asked me to come coach in Switzerland at one of the division one teams. I'm like, yeah, do I want to, do I like, I'd love to, but then I got to worry about my girlfriend at the time, now wife. So I ended up not going to Switzerland, which kind of kicks myself sometimes. Cause that could have been awesome. <laughs> you know, being a professional coach in Switzerland. So I was, was over there in September. Were you? It, okay. Yeah. So the guy, uh, do you know Michelle Bollet? No. Nope. Uh, the name rings a bell. I don't know. Oh, he more was context. He was the prof, he was the president of the Swiss Volleyball Coaches Association, I believe, or yeah. the Swiss Volleyball Association. I don't know. I digress. I digress. Yeah, we definitely digress. We digress. Okay. <laughs> um. So what's worked for me? Um is I really enjoy listening more than I speak. Um, there's times when players would come off the court and say, hey, this girl has a bad attitude. We got to quell it or whatever. And, and she could be having a, a stellar game, but with a poopy pants attitude. But it, just because she's doing well doesn't mean that everybody else is doing well. So I have to really listen to my players and really listen to what they have to say. Uh, and I really enjoy listening to the and watching the off court dynamics, seeing how they interact. And you can get into the five different types of leadership that you want to be, or the five different, um, you know, there's the locker room leader, the on court leader, the, the silent leader, you know, the whatever. So I, every person attracts to different people. And so when people say like, oh, I want to have a team bonding night with my group and I, it's upsetting that they aren't working together. Well, like there's people in your life that you don't like, so you don't have to deal with them. This is, again, as males, we can sit here and, have this dynamic of we can hate each other outside of volleyball, but then when we're on the court, we're a team. Yep. So it's really interesting when I get into volleyball coaches and trainers and people are asking for, um, uh, what's the word, uh, like bonding or cohesive or whatever. It's, you know, it's not something you can really just meld together and say, do it. Um, so you've got you to gotta learn how to avoid comfortability as well. And it, it really just shows that you have that authoritative aspect. Even though I say we work together and we're one unit, there still has to be someone that's like, boop, just above, you know, and, and, and guiding and guiding the self-discovery. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that... Um, I think uh, is when I was coaching at university of Guelph, we had this guy named Josh and Josh, how do I put it? He was a college kid. It was like, you know, he goes out and parties and whatever. And so all the guys called him greener, Josh green, green is his last name. And so you could see the, the coaching staff would call him greener and he'd be, Oh, whatever. I do what I want. No. But then I started calling him Joshua by his real name and he perked up differently and he, he had a different attitude towards how we interacted. So once we avoid that comfortability, then we can really get into establishing the differences in roles. Um, we say that we're all on the same page, but still I'm going to listen to input and what's that going to be that part of your philosophy of listening and deciphering and discerning and applying. So again, you're the adult and you're the mentor. You're not the person who's like, yeah, well, hey, here's six numbers. Go play volleyball. Okay. To, your, to your first bullet there about uh, listening. Yes. I, I just started reading um, Learning from My Life and Years at Manchester United by Alex Ferguson, who's a pretty good coach by all accounts. He's okay. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a quote he's got in here that I tagged. Most people don't use their eyes and ears effectively. They aren't very observant, and they fail to listen intently. As a result, they miss half of what's going on around them. 
I could think of some managers who could talk underwater. I don't think it helps them. There's a reason that God gave us two eyes, two ears, uh, and one mouth. It's, it's so you can listen and watch twice as much as you talk. Without First of all, listening costs you nothing. That is absolutely correct. That's one of my favorite quotes. I love it. No, that's that's yeah. really good. Yeah. Um, no, and, and and that's that's the thing is like a lot of young coaches, I should say, or new coaches want to go out and prove that they can take on the world and that they're the top of the food chain and all this. But to your point that Neil deGrasse Tyson of, you know, you're not going to learn until you don't know that you don't know anything. Right. So once you can sit back and learn and then apply, then you can apply and, and be a fruitful coach. And when you apply that into your philosophy of listening and learning, your players will see that more than you just talking and talking and talking, you know, and saying, do this, do that. So what I, I just enjoy the fact that I listen more, hopefully, than I talk. Um, okay. So uh, when I watched the other night, Dan talked about goal setting. And so this is kind of one that, I'd want to reflect back on Dan's presentation. Um, and how long ago was the last Monday? Was it correct? Um, sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Mm. So go back and watch this one. Go watch Dan Mickle's goal setting one, because frankly, this slide is moot compared to the entire presentation he did on it. And I was, absolutely enthralled with him because I enjoy listening to him talk. <laughs> um, we actually had a little bit of an issue with the recording of that one. It was Dan's re-recording it. Oh, potentially as we speak right now. So maybe knowing, by the time people see this, Dan will have sent me, well, you know, knowing him, he's doing it with uh, a cigar and a whiskey. <laughs> and quite frankly, I'm jealous. We have questions going on here. Uh, we have so many them, things. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we can. One of them I'm, I'm getting sorted out right now. Um, the other one I think we can get to in a little bit. So you can keep going. Okay, okay. I'll keep. Okay, okay. So, um, so this is again what we want is our philosophy of moving and and always learning and that those who don't move do not notice their chains and again if you're not moving forward you're stuck in this this complacency and you're stuck in who cares like i, I don't know I, I i take a lot from other coaches and and you should too anybody should when you develop your philosophy sport is the, I say the X's and O's are the easiest thing in regards to sport. Um, you know, you can talk different types of strategies, uh, perimeter rotation, um, fast offense, um, we, whatever, you know, different angles or whatever. It doesn't matter. They really don't matter because if you only focus on that one little aspect, of of play then your players are going to see that and if you're not improving mentally physically as a coach metaphysically then you're just staying still and you're you're getting so complacent and getting past and i think oh god what was the marv dumpy quote of i i, I wish somebody could help me out with this but he was like he said something to the extent of like, I want to be, if, if something's already been in place for a year or a new trend has been in place for a year, I'm already too late, you know? Um, so, and I think Marv said this 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. 
And I was talking to Kess, and he was saying how um, he had a, a what's it called, a, a heart surgeon um, friend, and he said, if I was doing now what I did five years ago, I'd have lost my license. You know, mm -hmm. and so you see that you have to keep evolving, and every year I'm going to go back to this is every year you've got to do redo and reassess and re-understand what's important to you as a coach and how is that going to apply to your future teams. So when you're in this situation of hopefully you're learning after every season, what's going to be applicable? You know, I've got a two-year-old and now I understand thoroughly the value of family and how that's so important. So that's going to tailor into my coaching philosophy. So I, as a, I want you guys to keep moving and keep asking and gaining knowledge. And so it, I'm always open to help and always open to read philosophies and share mine. So um, I think my thing is right there. There's my email, sean.manzi at gmail. Um, and I'm always more than welcome to read, listen. But you as a philosophizer, philosophizer, a coach, has to understand that your philosophy is really a big guideline for what you want and what you believe. And if you're not going to sit there and say, okay, here's, here's our expectations, here's what I want out of my athletes, then they're just going to keep walking all over you. And you're going to say, well, you know, I don't get it. It's the same things and kids these days and all that crap. And so a lot of times we really have to understand that once we write down and take the time to develop our philosophy and reflect on what it is after every season, we can grow and become better coaches. So are you really revisiting this and then – are you accountable for your philosophy? So, yeah. Any questions, comments, concerns? All right. We, we've got one question that kind of ties in with something that, that I had jotted down. Okay. And that's the, that's the, the question is at the college level, are there other variables that co college coaches should look at when developing slash rethinking their coaching philosophy? Um, and I would also toss in there the idea that, or the question of how much does does should your philosophy be influenced by the organization inside of which you work at the priorities that they have in place yeah. and, and put upon you? Yeah. Okay. So, um, excuse me. So I've got two two um, extremes, you could say examples um my first one is the just win just win at all costs it doesn't matter um when i was uh, at a school in new mexico the athletic director didn't really care about growth and development he's like i don't bring in the best athletes um you know their gpas will get them in no big deal just just win right and you could see a drain on the kids and the players that that was our thing. And we as a coaching staff felt immensely pressured that if we didn't win, we were losing our jobs. And we understand that, you know, we were human and there's so many ulterior reasons, you know, injuries or, you know, a split on the road is a good, is a good weekend and all these things. So, um, it, it was a big emotional dream. Uh, and this last school I was at in North Carolina, the entire desire is to win the sportsmanship award of, um, you know, your hospitality, how you are as how, and officials, um, and how you interact with the fan bases. So it, it it's, it has to be curtailed to every um, um, 
uh, institution. Uh, and when you have your philosophy that hopefully blends in with the institution's philosophy, then that's going to be a success. That's, that's twofer. But you're going through this process of, um, you know, interviewing process to become one with uh, the university or the school. Uh, you should already know what you want and what you desire. And that's so many times in those questions where you can ask or those uh, interview sessions where you can ask, okay, what does the school believe about this? What about this? And if you're able to amend appropriately, that's still okay. But if you two are totally the opposite, it's just going to be hell on both. So that's one thing I, I did and did not like about the college game is that this is I this is what I believe. Now I've got to find a school that has the same belief and it's really got to find that match. And it's not easy. It really isn't. Um, and, you know, one guy I really look up to is John Dunning because he goes comes into Stanford, he's extremely intelligent kids, and he, uh, women, I should say, excuse me, and he's able, he sits there and he's like, these girls are way smarter than me. I don't understand it, you know? And it's interesting to watch how he just always learns from them and from his players. Uh, so when I'm at those two different extremes, how are you going to find that median and what's going to blend for both uh, coach and administration? The other thing that I would toss out there, you talk about the annual review, yeah, which I think is, is good no matter what. Um, yeah. The one caution I would throw out with, with regard to your philosophy is there are probably certain things in your philosophy that shouldn't be very, very, very flexible. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. Uh, so, you know, you don't, you don't want to be re revisiting them every year. But the other side of it is there are th things that happen in a season which may have you ask questions of your philosophy, unjustifiable, shall we say. Yeah. So it may be a case where, okay, maybe it's a sense of you just need a bit of distance so you can see things a little bit more objectively before you really go in and, and have an assessment. Or there might be times where, okay, there's a flaw in your yeah. philosophy that you need to iron out somewhere. Sure. Sure. And there's a lot of times when you hold these things to be true. You know that these are your core values. And, um, you know, when, when you have to turn in a paper or something, I don't know, I had a, uh, my advisor in university said it's never done, it's just do. So that's one thing that's big on our philosophy is you can amend it and change it and then have it set for the season. So you're not wavering and you're not going back and forth like, okay, well, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change halfway through the season. You know, if you're going to mess up, do it full speed. So when you've got your philosophy set for the year, it, it's set. It's not going anywhere. So that's what I really enjoy about redoing these after the season is you can reflect and say, okay, what worked, what didn't work. And did I, was I true to what I established as my core value of beliefs? You know? Yep. Yeah, Mo is suggesting that uh, <laughs> uh, every time I come back from the ABCA convention, it makes me question my philosophy and the way I do things. <laughs> Good. Good. It should. That's the point. Yeah, exactly. That's the, point. That's the whole point. As long as you don't let it overwhelm you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, Which is yeah. definitely a possibility when you're early in your career. Yeah, it's a lot of uh, paralysis by analysis. Um, you know, and, and there's obviously some books that, that I read. And uh, the one that I read every year is called Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek. Um, that one is phenomenal readers eat la leaders eat last um the one i give to my captains every year is um oh shoot oh god it's it's about the all blacks 
Um, oh yeah, I, I, yeah. I think uh, I know the one you're talking about. Oh gosh. If it's if it's the popular one. Yeah, it's it's yeah, from great. a couple years ago. Yep. Legacy. <laughs> yeah. yep, legacy. Yep. That's right. Legacy. legacy. There we go. Um, yeah. And then um, and then I've got I think there's a handful of things that I can email out in regards to um, developing the leadership styles and then the types of leaders that you want to be. Um, and I don't know, it's, the, the more you read, the more you can, whatever. And go to something different. Go to a different sport event. Well, not, you know, right now, not in this time of cholera, you know, no, no sport in the time of COVID. But um, it, it, just sit behind the glass, sit behind the bench and listen to how they interact. Because again, sport is easy. Like the, the X's and O's are easy. Um, and so here in Guelph, uh, we've got a, a pretty, pretty big uh, hockey team called the Guelph Storm. And they, um, I always get my tickets right behind the glass, either of the Storm or of the, op the opposing coaches, just so I can watch how they interact because mm -hmm. you sit on the bench for, let's say, four or five minutes, and then guys come off on their shift, and the coach interacts with them. So it's really fun watching the interaction, and then, and then, you know, these kids are going to the NHL. They're they're good athletes. So my idea is, you go to a different sporting event and watch how the coaches interact and how the coaches do, you know, and. And take into consideration the culture. You know, you've got hockey, which is which is a fighting culture and a um, you know an aggressive culture. Um, but how what is good, what's bad? So take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. you know? I actually just finished the book that you recommended to me. I don't know, three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, which one? Let's see. Oh, you did finish Legacy. No, Messi, Messi, and I don't oh, mean Messi. I don't mean the soccer player. I mean untidy. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That one, that one was phenomenal. That was that was a really good book. I'm I'm actually really impressed that you remember that. Um, on my list that's you know when you talk you were reading it at the time. Yeah. So I put it on my list. It just yeah. took me like three years to get to it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> that was okay. So there was a quote in there that was uh, Benjamin Franklin. I want to say was that the one where he uh, Benjamin Franklin had this quote about like people love organized and tidy and succinct, but in reality, your life is not that. Your your life is all these different things. And was that the book where they had the different uh, Nobel Prize laureates and the Nobel Prize laureates, each one was working on at least six different projects? Oh, I don't remember that bit. I remember okay. things like the Germans trying to make their forests really, really orderly for the sake yeah. of efficient logging. Yeah, and no. realized that it was killing the the, the nutrients in yes. in the soil and all that because yeah. you know you didn't have all the ancillary stuff that normally goes into a forest. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and I think like the very first thing was, is it okay to have a messy desk and, and what's the optimal filing system? It's like <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to revisit that one. Yeah, I'm I'm now working on the the Wu Tang book. Um, uh, it's it's pretty good, but anyways, um, no. So so I'm always open to chat, um, and uh, I I read about a book a week. So the more you want to throw at me, the more I'll I'll read. So all right. I don't know. I'm a big fan of your philosophy. So if you want me to re review it, um, there's my email address, Sean dot at Gmail, or most people know how to get a hold of me on Facebook. So yeah. yeah. Alrighty, cool. Why is there why, oh successful successful coaching? Okay. Yeah, that's say, why, is there, why is there an ISBN on there? 
Like yeah, yeah no, that's your, what we got. Your there. own personal ISBN? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not cool like you. I'm not. I, I don't have a personal ISBN. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, I'm still waiting on my signed copy, John. I want a signed copy oh, of the book. You, you moved north of the border. Oh, yeah. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Did I sign one for you when, uh, when we were in Columbus? Uh, no. no. That was I the didn't. last time we were in the same area. As was that the was that the one that I um, edited? No. Uh, uh, well, you might have read some of it. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> All right. Anyways. We digress again. We digress again. Okay. All okay. right. Um, that's all the questions that have been posted. So uh, unless there are any last minute stuff that you quickly shoot in, I think we're, we're, we're calling it a wrap. Listen more than you speak, you know, listen yes. more than you speak. That's Absolutely. Very okay. Much. All right. Cool. Good one. Right. We'll see you around, Sean. All right. Thanks, John. I appreciate it, buddy. Thanks everybody tuning in.